Welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. As always, I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful that we can be a part of your life. Thank you, everyone, who's been active in the Muscle Intelligence community. It's been amazing to hear with, hear from you and connect with you. Today's episode is a deep dive into the conversation around epigenetics. What does that mean? And how much do our genetics actually play a role into optimizing our body, mind, and life? And, and can ultimately we influence it? And the answer is absolutely yes, we can. Dr. Ben Lynch joins me today to talk about how we can impact it, what variables we should be looking at, what are the most important variables. Dr. Lynch has written a book called Dirty Genes that dives into the eight most important SNPs that will ultimately allow you to thrive. And we get into each of the SNPs today that are going to create the greatest impact and then ultimately how to change them or how to optimize them, let's say. Uh, we talk about dopamine in the brain and how those are very much genetic and how you may be experiencing symptoms. We talk about MTHFR. We talk about um, other epigenetic influences on both of these pathways. Now, those pathways are the ones we spent the most time on today because I think most people have heard of those and uh, maybe are misled or um, misguided on those things. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting considerations, uh, specifically in the dopamine pathway. We spent a good amount of time in the beginning of the podcast getting into understanding dopamine and the implications of uh, short-term and long-term and how it's going to be implicated in learning and stress avoidance and some really interesting stuff. And at the end, we get into you know my typical conversation around parenting and maybe how you can um, take this information that you've been empowered with and apply it to um, ultimately being a better parent or understanding people in a, in a better way and looking at people rather than judging someone's behavior. You can sit back and objectively observe and say, hey, maybe this is why this is happening and this is how I could help. Right. So if somebody, you see someone who's really stressed out or someone who's anxious and then understanding that from a uh, neurochemical perspective. So from perspective of dopamine, acetylcholine and epinephrine, uh, maybe we can start to support rather than condemn. And it's really interesting, really interesting conversation. I highly suggest you go out and get the book Dirty Genes. Dr. Ben Lynch wrote it a few years back and has had massive success. He's also created a supplement company around it. And you guys can check that out at your discretion. Today's podcast is brought to you by Billings, or otherwise known as the Wild Alaskan Seafood Box.com. Guys, I can't give it my higher, I can't give it a higher recommendation if I can find my tongue today. It's fantastic. Absolutely love it. Huge fan. And as I've said before, I'm not a fan of fish, or at least I haven't been. So head over to Wild Alaskan Seafood Box.com slash Ben. Use the discount code Ben and get $20 off your first order. And you're going to get about five pounds of fish, which for some of us is uh, a lot. For others, it's not. I usually get about two boxes sent to my house every month, and I go through them pretty quickly. Here's the crazy thing. All my, my little people like it as well. And when, when children like food or like healthy food, you know it's high quality. It just tastes so incredibly delicious. So my favorite way to prepare my salmon lately has been just literally – a light sear in the in the up uh, on the stovetop on a cast iron skillet, and then guess what I put on top? I put a little bit of sea salt and a lot of olive oil. And it's just so delicious. And I cook it for about three minutes on each side, and it's still a little bit, to be honest, a little bit raw in the center. I just absolutely love it. It falls apart. It's just so delicious. And I'm so grateful for John over at WildLastSeafoodBox.com for hooking us up. So you can get wild Alaskan seafood straight to your door. And it comes really fast, which is awesome. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoy the podcast with Dr. Ben Lynch. If you do so, I'm sure he would appreciate a follow on social media. Without further ado from me, Dr. Ben Lynch, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm a fan of what you do. I've got your book, Dirty Jeans, sitting here in front of me. And this is a book that has literally created a huge subculture uh, in the world, right? there, there's you know people who I don't know if you probably know this. There's there's people who base their supplement recommendations and their supplement consumption based on your book. And I don't know if there's a company based around your book as well, but I believe there's there's that too. Um, you know, people that are really um, kind of taking the deep dive into your teachings. So this is uh, definitely an honor to have you on the show. Yeah, awesome to be here, Ben, and, and uh, thanks for sharing my message and and uh, look forward to helping serve your audience and yourself. Yeah, how did you get into epigenetics? So just to give the audience kind of a framework here of maybe of what, what epigenetics is and then how you got into it would be very interesting. And, and we'll get down to, you know, the nitty gritty at some point, but just starting off kind of high level. 
Yeah, well, you know, throughout my life, starting early years, you know, early teens, um, you know, we all probably had the mindset that you kind of look at your parents and you look at your grandparents and your brothers and your sisters and, you, and you, you're hearing what runs in your family and your family history. And, you know, Jack's, you know, Uncle Jack's an alcoholic and and Grandma Joe is bipolar and, you know, so-and-so died of a heart attack at 45. And you're like, well, I got a bright future ahead of me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so you just hear these things. And, you know, at a young kid in early 20s, you don't really think anything of it because you think you're healthy and vibrant. But uh, what really stood out for me was uh, one day I was standing in the hallway um, and I, I just I got pushed up against the, the wall somehow in the hallway. And my stepmom was conversing with this lady and, and they were talking about schizophrenia. And um, uh, my stepmom uh, said, oh, yeah, schizophrenia runs in your genes. And and, uh, you know, you're you're hitting pre-puberty and, and it hits around puberty, you know, around 18 is when it starts to affect you. And I'm, I'm like 16, 17. I'm thinking I got a year to go. Um, so that, that was one of the first things to hit. So, but, um, you know, and it just kind of evolved from there because it's, you know, when you have about 70, 80% of your patients doing really well and you know, the remaining not, I always focus on the not. I do celebrate my successes kind of, that's one of my weaknesses is not celebrating successes. I focus on weaknesses. Um, from that does come a strength. Um, and that is, you know, trying to figure out why things are happening the way they are. And so I really stuck into individualizing um, treatments and understanding why specific people struggled. And that led to epigenetics through Dr. Bruce Lipton's work. And epigenetics is basically uh, what influences our genes. So we, we think of our genes as static, immobile things. And our eye color, skin color, hair color, yeah, those are pretty much static. You know, you, you're born with that, and that's that's what you – that thinking is what goes down to all the other 18,000 genes in your human body. But that's not the case. Uh, you know, if I say lemon, lemon, sour lemon, police car, murder, you know, there's all sorts of things happening right now in your brain that's stimulating certain things. You may have gotten warmer. Your heart rate may have increased. You may have started salivating. That's how fast epigenetics works. So – Interestingly, uh, maybe the question that I have is what percentage then, if, if we know that eye color and hair color and, and height maybe and, and body composition structure maybe can't, or composition wouldn't, shouldn't be included there, but body structure maybe can't be influenced genetically or, or epigenetically, do we have any kind of scope as to what level of influence? Um, and, and is it the type of thing that maybe changes over age, uh, as we age? So like, it, you know, being exposed to one thing as a child may have a different influence than if you're an adult. Yeah, and vice versa. Um, yes, uh, fantastic question. And I'm surprised I haven't been asked that before. Um, so while we, I haven't seen a specific study saying that, um, you know, this percentage of our genes are, you know, have a lot of epigenetic controls and these have, you know, very static, you just, that's just how it is. Um, so, but what I can reference is cancer and, and other conditions. So, you know, and I research Every, almost every single day uh, I'm researching and I've got research papers all over my desk. And, and uh, so when you're looking at, you know, various conditions like celiac disease, you know, that's a genetic cause. If you start looking for genetic causes of rheumatoid arthritis or ulcerative colitis or Crohn's or, you know, ADHD or depression or cancer of all types, um, you know, you, you're basically finding that it's mostly epigenetic cancer is on the high side from what I've seen in research, which seems really, really high compared to all the other papers I've seen. The high side is 5% genetic. Wow. On average, what I'm seeing is 1% of all cancers are genetic. And then Parkinson's, you know, it's like, again, half to 1% of Parkinson's is genetic. And 23andMe was was basically, um, you know, she was married to one of the founders of uh, Google. I think it was Sergey Brin. Um, whose mom uh, has Parkinson's. I can't remember. It was one of the Google founders' moms has Parkinson's. And so 23andMe was kind of this way to pool a bunch of data from the human population and then ask certain questions in survey and then, you know, with approval to see if, you know, maybe say, you know, I did 23andMe and they have the questions like, do any of your family members struggle with Parkinson's? And you say yes or no. 
then they can pool that data and say, okay, well, if, you know, 90% of Parkinson's people are saying that they have these, you know, they say yes, and they have this set of genes, then they can say, okay, there's potential here, you know, that these genes are associated with Parkinson's, but they have not finding that. Again, it's like half to 1% of most conditions are, are genetic. How much of a stimulus, I guess, so there's one more level of that question was, I guess, before we move on, um, you know, if I'm exposed to something as a child and knowing that my, my nervous system is developing, my body synthesizing more protein, my, D, my DNA may be more active, um, would that make it a greater likelihood that I'm going to, to experience a potential negative symptom in uh, adulthood rather than, you know, experience something in adulthood? So basically, we'll have a bigger kind of fat tail uh, effect on the back end to be exposed to to negative things in childhood. And the reason I bring that up, I've got children as do you, and I'm, I'm hyper aware of this this um, paradigm that exists in the world of like, oh, they're kids, let them let them eat that, it's okay. Or hey, they're kids, they'll be all right. And I go in the opposite direction, like I, I'm like the the uh, the mother hen protector, right? I was like, well, why would I want this person whose genes are evolving, whose nervous system is developing, whose, whose cells are are experiencing these these epigenetic shifts at every second to experience any, anything other than the optimal state. Yes. Um, short answer to that question is is a is a huge major yes. And um, so you know if if you if as a parent you know and you are providing your kids I, I mean I, I shudder to think that I, this happens and it, it does. Uh, we are in America. Um, you know I'll be walking through the airport. And I will be seeing um, babies uh, literally being, you know, given spoonfuls of Coca-Cola. Or um, French fries, man. French fries. Be crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and I, I would see uh, parents, you know, having uh, obese children at probably seven. Um, you know, I remember vividly seeing this thin father with a child who was grossly obese, having like, I'm not kidding you, plates full of, of burgers and fries and, and milkshakes. I mean, I, I, I almost went over there. I almost went over there, but I didn't. Um, so, you know, there's more to the story than we know. But in short, um, you know, our decisions as parents and during pregnancy, we can't forget that. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of us, uh, you know, a buddy of mine, uh, Sean Bean, had a great point on his Facebook post one, one day. He goes, you know, some of us spend tens of thousands of dollars on our wedding and, and months of planning. And then we just get pregnant randomly mm -hmm. or, you know, plan, but you know, and that's it. So yeah. I thought that was a very, very good point. Yeah. It's an entitlement thing, right? People think oh, I'm entitled to have a child. And I think it should be like, uh, I don't know. I think it's going a little bit far to think you should have to write a test, but I think there should be a level of education where, okay, you got pregnant. You should be aware of all of these best practices to help your child flourish in this world, but nobody seems to care that much. So speaking about the pregnancy thing, I think there's, you know, even if we look a little bit deeper, I'd love to have you speak of cross-generational epigenetics, which mm. seems to be this very interesting thing that exists and can potentially go back a certain number of generations. I'd love for you to give us a little more uh, information about that and really how much is, you know, your grandmother was exposed to uh, DDT and, and you're going to be there for having some potential predisposition to, to estrogen uh, dysregulation or, or breast cancer. Like, is that reality? It is reality. And um, I don't talk about this very much um, as much as I want to, because uh, ultimately it's, it's kind of, what do you do about it? Disempowering. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I you know, and, I, and we will talk about it uh, now because um, it's an important thing to, to understand. Um, but it is ultimately, I don't like talking about things that we don't have control over. Um, and that's but, the whole thing. So ultimately you, you do have control over what your grandkids get, right? And that's maybe the, maybe the empowering. Yes, side of that. that's true. So when you understand there's, yeah, you can always feedback, you can always flip things around, right? There's always a political spin if you want. Um, but, uh, that's, a, that's a great point. I, I have yet to figure out how I can turn this into a positive um, a, because I haven't really been focusing on it too much, but, you know, your point of, of spinning it into, you know, hey, since this can happen, then, you know, you can really empower your grandchildren now. And I do talk about that uh, with pregnancy, but not not on the backside. So what you're talking about is of cross, um, you know, translational uh, is, is actually it's it's called translational epigenetics. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're translating over to your next generation. What? their genes are going to be programmed, how they're going to be programmed. 
And you're thinking, well, that sounds kind of creepy. Well, why would you do that? Well, imagine you're in a war zone. Okay. As a, as a, as a future mom and dad, you don't have kids yet. Future mom and dad, everything is glorious. You're fine. And then a war hits. There's bombs being dropped. There's, there's, you know, you're running, you're sprinting, you know, there's food shortages. Uh, there's chemicals in the air. Um, there's loud noises constantly. Um, there's tons of epinephrine and adrenaline flowing through your blood. And all that is influencing your baby. And it's influencing the genetics of your baby. And it's, it's turning them on, certain genes on and certain genes off because it's preparing your baby to survive in that specific environment where they're going to be born. It's a survival of the fittest thing. Yeah. Imagine if we did not have translational epigenetics, what would happen? You're in a war zone, the baby's in a complete cocoon, isolated completely from, from uh, the mother's uh, you know, hormones and vitamins and minerals. It just has this perfect little environment and then it's spat out into the world. That was horrible. Um, it's introduced into the world and it has no inherent understanding of what's going to happen. And when you say inherent understanding, well, what do you mean by that? I mean, I the genes have no preparation of what's going to hit. And so then it becomes chaos. Yes. So translational epigenetics is actually allows survivability of the future generations. And if you look at famines in, in you know, Ireland and England um, back centuries ago, these were called thrifty genes. So these, the children of parents who were starving during pregnancy, they were, they were really, really good at being thrifty with the amount of caloric intake and nutritional intake they received. So what happened? Well, they were introduced in the world and the famine was over. Famine was over, now food was plentiful. What do you think happened? Obese. Obesity. You know, so obesity, is that the only reason for obesity? Oh, no. Um, but it's, it's an epigenetic susceptibility that the genes are pre-programmed. Now, can you undo that pre-programming? Good question. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But you can still influence those particular genes. And when I showed uh, Dr. Robert Navio uh, my book and we were having discussions about it and he's looked at my genetic uh, report strategy and, and what have you, um, Bob sat down and he's like, you know, We've had multiple discussions and he goes, hey, Ben, you know, what you talk about are what called what we call in genetics eco alleles. I was like, huh, tell me more. He goes, the genes that you talk about, MTHFR, COMT, DAO, with for, you know, regarding histamine and dopamine and nitric oxide, all that. These are eco alleles. And what I mean by eco allele is they're environmentally influenced heavily and they're selected for over time, generations over time to allow survivability of specific people um, in specific environments under specific situations. So MTHFR was passed down um, for individuals typically living in, in malarial uh, infested areas. Why? Because MTHFR acts more slowly. It allows conservation of a different type of folate to allow uh, red blood cell, white blood cell platelets uh, to, you know, to form. And you need those with malaria because malaria destroys all that. So they need more of a different type of folate to survive. And so in other areas, you know, MTHFR was not plentiful um, because possibly they had, you know, huge amounts of folate in their environment or they, they did not have uh, sun um, in the huge amounts. So there's, there's reasons why we've inherited these genes. The problem is, it's not really a problem, it's just a lack of understanding is that we're no longer living in those environments under those specific conditions. Right. So one thing you said um, that I'd love to just mention is um, you're, you still haven't yet found a positive reason to make people aware of these epigenetic changes. Well, exactly the reason that you started researching genetics, right? You created an awareness. You had a fear-based awareness around, uh, gosh, I have this predisposition. What can I do right now to change it? And I think for anybody out there, if you shine a light and you go, hey, if you don't pay attention to this, you're going to die young. Creating that low level, I mean, uh, obviously there's the subjectivity as far as age, but like, hey, you got to start paying attention to this or you, you, you're not going to thrive. Many people, not all, but many people will actually start to take action on it, we hope, right? I know for myself, yeah. if somebody said, hey, like you're going to be predisposed to this, if you just take these couple of vitamins or at least, you know, get some sun exposure or don't get so, I don't know, don't get obese, like maybe that, that, that awareness helps people take action earlier. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's two things that change people from my basic understanding of, of this, and, and it's, it's fear and pleasure, mm -hmm. pleasure and pain. 
-hmm. You know, if, if, you know, if, you know, you touch a hot burner once you're going to remember not to touch that again, Yeah. you know, and then, you know, you have sex and it's like, Oh, that felt good. You want to have sex again. So, and if, if you start running, it kind of hurts in the beginning, but you're really proud of yourself for doing it. And then you start feeling better the next day or that night you sleep amazingly well, the best night you've sleep you've ever had. And then you tie that. It's like, Oh, what, what happened? How did my best sleep? Oh, I went for a run. I want to have a best night's sleep again. Yeah. So I guess is the flip side of that where some people will go, ah, screw it. I'm going to, I'm toast anyway. So what we should also acknowledge that. And hopefully most people don't take that. Mentality. I have family members with that mindset yeah. and um, you know, it really pr- uh, troubled me in the beginning and it, it troubled me as a, as a health professional for decades. Um, you know, well, it, ha- it bothered me as an individual for decades as a, as a health professional for a decade plus. And um, I've finally, it still troubles me, but I've learned to understand where they are in their journey. And all I do is I just plant the seed. I give them, you know, some information and however they receive it is totally cool. It's up to them. And I'm able to just leave it at that. And I, I, there's, as you said, there's, there's, there is a movement with, from Dirty Jeans. This has created a, this subculture, which is really cool. And, um, and, but I've warned them. Um, you know, the people who are really, really thrilled about dirty jeans, what they do is they, they, they buy the book for all their friends and all their family. And they say, here, here, you got to read this. You got to read this. And I told him, I said, I love that you're doing that, but I really want to warn you right now is that some of them are going to say, no, thanks. I don't want it. And you're going to be really, you know, well, you got to read it. It can really help you. They're not ready to receive it. So you just, you just have to let it go. And it, it's tough. Yeah, I think if people aren't willing or ready to change their behavior, it's almost, you know, I could see someone arguing, it's almost better that they just don't know. Like if I'm not willing to stop drinking alcohol, if I'm not willing to stop smoking cigarettes and eating McDonald's, well, I don't want to know the negative health effects because I'm just not, I, I don't, maybe I don't believe enough in myself and my ability to stop. It's this idea of being a victim, right? I don't feel empowered enough to change. So therefore I don't want to know. Well, it's, I see this with my kids and, um, I, I'm, I'm learning how to deal with it. So Xbox, I hate that thing, you know, mm-hmm. I hate it. Um, so I didn't have video games really as a kid. And, um, you know, I go to my friend's houses and I, I would play them and I was like, wow, this is so cool. Um, loved it. And so you want to provide those opportunities for your kids. And then, but video games now are so addictive. I mean, it, it's not, it's not uh, block where you're moving, you know, your little Atari stick to, to bounce a ball back and forth. You know, your dopamine hit from that isn't very big. Um, so, but your dopamine hit playing Fortnite's massive um, with all the time pressure and the zone closing in and, and sniper shots and oh God, whatever. Um, so I'd have these conversations with my youngest boy and I was like, you know, I really don't want you playing that very much. And um, he goes, yeah, I know dad. And then he'd go back upstairs and he'd start playing it again. And you know, they, that is what that damn game does. It, it literally ruins people because they get such a huge amount of dopamine hit that from the game, that when they unplug from the game, that their normal life sucks yep. because, you know, hanging out with your parents or your friends, you don't get that much dopamine from them. So it's not fun. Um, how old is your son? He's uh, 11 going on 12. And so what I want to say to that, I want to expand a little bit more is I get mad at him. I was like, you got to stop playing this. That won't work. And then you could just see him just sink and go internal and sad and, and it, it, it cr- just crushes me. So we got rid of it. And then this stupid quarantine hit and a friend brought over Xbox and it's starting again. Yeah. I implemented a rule in my house where my kids don't play video games yet, but I actually just caved and allowed them to get Minecraft because I was like, there could be utility with that. Minecraft, pretty cool. Um, yeah, but my rule is for every hour that you read, you get an hour of Minecraft. So it balances, right? So if, if they want that, it's almost like you have to work a little bit for it. And it sucks that it makes it a reward, but at least it's balanced. Um, so if they want to play an hour, hey, man, you got to read an hour of a book. And uh, How do you enforce that? Uh, they, they enforce it themselves. They give them a timer. And so they set the timer to whatever time they, they have to show me the timer. And when, they, when, the, when the timer goes off and they're able to go and play the game, I literally bought them each timers. 
I'm like, yeah, you got this little thing when it, when it dings, you're able to go in and play your, your game for the equal amount of time. And I think that's a reasonable thing. Like that is you're, you're learning, you're, you're, you're expanding your brain, you're improving your ability to read and acquire knowledge, and you're still getting these, these rewards at the end. So hopefully again, who knows, right? I'm not perfect at parenting, but uh, working on it certainly. Yeah. This, and you know, Minecraft is a, is a, is I think is a, one of those games where it's, it's, it's fun, but the dopamine hit isn't massive. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, you, I don't think you could do that with Fortnite. Um, and it's, you know, I would block time through the, the, the parenting app. And, you know, I know we're derailing a little bit here, but it, there's, this is it still ties into what we're talking about because there's, you know, some people can be wired what their, where their life is, is kind of lower dopamine. You know, their genes for, for producing dopamine are actually not so strong and yet their genes for eliminating dopamine are really strong. So they cannot have this low dopamine underlying, you know, genetic susceptibility their whole life, which does have benefits. Um, the problem is when they, they get in front of Xbox, um, you know, they have this huge spike. It's just like when look at actors and, and actresses and, and famous people, um, you know, or they go to, you know, they're, they're movie stars and they have all this attention, massive amounts of attention. And they're on the red carpet and they go home and it's quiet. It's just them sitting on the couch. They went from dopamine way up here to dopamine way down here in a matter of hours. And I, and so they turned to alcohol, they turned to drugs. So they, cause they, they can't deal with that huge swing, you know, music musicians, you know, hundred thousand people listening to them, watching them, cheering them on. And they go home in their apartment, really? And they just crash. Right. So they turn to cocaine and, why do you have a honeymoon after your wedding? I think the same thing. Because I remember when, when my wife and I got married, we got married as a small wedding, but we still had like 24 people around and it was great. And then they all left and it was just us. And it was all the tension and focus was on us, 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 us for like days, we got two days. And then they, they all left and I was just like, wow. And the next day I woke up and it was quiet. And I was like, this is why there's a honeymoon, Nadia. And we haven't, we didn't go on a honeymoon. We, I couldn't, I was in the middle of a big job. So. Yeah. yeah, that's brilliant. And so actually that's the perfect segue. Let's, let's unpack that from, from a genetic standpoint, right? So when you speak of dopamine pathways, are you referring to comp T specifically, or is there, I'm sure there's a number of them, but I'd love to kind of start unpacking. Um, okay. So someone has this predisposition versus that one, maybe uh, how their brain would respond to something like that. And then maybe some of the um, supplemental or nutritional interventions you would suggest for people who maybe lack dopamine or maybe someone who has the comp T or um, again, maybe I don't know how well versed you are in that uh, pathway, but I'd love to have you explain it as best you can. Yeah. So I'm my, let me back up a little bit on this. Um, so when I wrote the book, dirty genes, first you it's like, well, okay, well, what do you mean by the title? A, a gene performs work. Just, just know that. So there's a lot of science and, and it can get over your head and you just automatically recoil because um, our ancestral brain is, is telling us to conserve energy. So we don't have to go out and expend energy and seek for food. So anything you're, is difficult for you to do, you kind of naturally recoil from it because it's expending energy. So lean into it right now. And because your ancestral brain is telling you not to, but let's go, you know, push against it. You have a fridge in your house. You can go get some more food. <laughs> um, so a gene is something that performs work. And, you know, we have about 18,000 different genes in the human body. And they don't really work on an individual basis. Some genes do work on an individual basis, but usually it's a team effort. You know, and it's, it's you don't have a soccer team and the you know, we have all this focus on maybe on the striker. Oh, the striker of, of, you know, FC Barcelona is amazing. They, they score all the goals and, you know, but it's probably the midfield and defense, you know, that set them up. Right. Yeah. So when we talk about singular genes right now, and we will be because it's you have to start simply. You have to understand that everything works as a team and it's, it's not just CMT working with your dopamine. It's, it's a huge amount of team effort. And I and I walk you through that in the book. So at the end of the book, I talk talk with you about how this gene and this gene and this gene and this gene are all working together. And if they're not all functioning, this one gene won't work very well. So with that said, a dirty gene is a gene that's not functioning optimally. And it's either working faster or slower. Okay. So with dopamine, you can 
there's multiple genes involved with it, but we are going to focus on one of them. And that one particular gene uh, works on the elimination of dopamine. And there's research that talks about if this gene, if you have no genetic variants in this particular gene, it's, it's what's typically found in, in, uh, in all of us. It works quite fast. And it actually works about 50% faster than people who had inherited a genetic variant where the gene is a little bit different. And so it's not really a mutation. You think of it as just a bit different. It, it changes its shape. And um, so anyway, it can work more slowly. So the majority of us have a COMT gene that works quickly. So we, the first step of our dopamine elimination is pretty fast. And if that happens, this is great uh, in, in terms of various reasons. One, you can perform under pressure. Stressful situations, you can handle really well. You could be a great ER doc, surgeon. Um, you could be a, you know, a competitive uh, athlete in multiple sports. Um, you could do uh, challenging things um, and, and lean into them and go for it. Um, and, and, and that's fantastic. Negatives, your brain wanders. You're kind of ADD, like you have lack of motivation. You can tend towards depression. You can, you can seek out addictions um, of any type. It could be shopping, sex, uh, drugs, alcohol, cigarette smoking, all these uh, increase your dopamine uh, in various ways. So if you've inherited a, your, a gene from your mom and dad, and you do, um, so let's say your, your dad passes you down a COMT gene, which is typical, and your mom also sent, sends you down a COMT gene, which is typical. You've inherited a COMT gene where it works naturally quickly, and your dopamine is going to be naturally cleared. So you may have these strengths and susceptibilities. Okay, so what do you do about it? Glad you asked. You can consume more protein. Simple. Um, you know, so that... Is it, just, is it just specific amino acids or is it just protein in general that's going to help support it? Tyrosine specifically. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you and you can do tyrosine specifically and have a, a good result. Um, but I first I like to, for people to think macro. I want people to think, OK, just protein, because the last thing I want people to do is going out and buying a supplement with tyrosine, because if you isolate your nutrients and you're focusing on one gene. Remember you you have a whole team at play here and you have 18,000 teammates. So a lot of us will focus on one or two teammates and you're going to lose the game. And, um, you know, you're going to push those teammates too hard. You're going to lean in on them too hard and they're going to be working too hard. And the other 18,000 of them, uh, are not going to get the support they need. So I want people thinking macro first, the fundamentals first, because, while we, again, we talk about seven, eight genes in the book, Dirty Genes, I do that not to overwhelm you, but in everything that you're doing in that book, as I explained, is cleaning and supporting all your genes. I just can't discuss 18,000 of them. It's, it's not even possible. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's someone who has a standardized or standard uh, CMT expression and now how about the other end of that so we've got heterozygous we've got homozygous recessive mm -hmm. what are we looking at as far as um how those things may express and maybe you can just go to the opposite of the spectrum and say someone who has you know double recessive cmt and give give perspective yeah so let's say a uh, good point so what's the flip side of that so the flip side is a slower cmt okay and what's that do well imagine what's cmt's job part of his job not his only job Part of his job is to move out dopamine. So if you've inherited uh, a type of CMT from your mom and dad that's slower, what's going to happen to your dopamine? It's, it's going to stay elevated. It's going to stay elevated. It's going to stay higher. And so if your dopamine stays higher, what's that going to do? It's going to allow you to focus, be driven, type A, uh, get your homework done, um, you know, be one of those really good students and, and, and always, you know, be on time and, and, and uh, not be on time, but have your homework done. Um, because you, you can focus and get your stuff done. Um, and, uh, it's going to give you nice, uh, I've got to stay focused on, on dopamine here. Um, now, so all that's great. Um, you're going to perform really well at, at jobs where you need to stay alert. So maybe you could be a security guard. I mean, you could have a night shift. Um, it's kind of boring, right? You know, pacing halls or streets. 
Um, but you've got enough dopamine in your brain to keep you a awake and, and, and B, you know, you're okay with these kind of boring jobs. It's not so boring to you because you got so much going on in your brain that, uh, you can entertain yourself. Um, you're, you're probably going to be good with reading books. Um, and, uh, you're not going to really seek out, uh, activities, which are more dangerous. So you're going to have probably less, uh, wounds and, and broken bones. Uh, I'll give you a short story. Uh, I was skiing with my boys one, one evening, night skiing. And, um, you know, my oldest boy sitting next to me on the chairlift, he goes, Oh dad, I got to show you this, uh, one shoot that I go with my friends. And then my middle boy, Matthew, who has very similar genes as I do. Um, so Matthew and I are more slow as uh, we have higher dopamine levels in our brain and, and Tasman has a lot faster and, uh, he, he clears his dopamine out. So we get off the chairlift, we're skiing down and he, he just stops. Hockey stop right next to the edge of this trail. And he goes, yeah, dad, let's hit it. And I look down and it's like this straight drop through a narrow chute of trees. And, and the kid's 13, you know, and uh, it just spits you out, you know, pretty far down at the bottom and it kind of levels out. But you're hauling butt through that chute. And he just, he goes, all right, let's go follow me. And he's gone, done. Matthew and I look at that and we're like, oh God, you know. <laughs> But he needs that. He needs right. that intensity. Matthew and I, we have enough dopamine just doing the, the groomer. We're good. That right. needs that hit. Um, so the negatives of that slower dopamine is, uh, you know, one, we're, we're going to be a little bit more timid, um, which has benefits and cons. Um, and the other thing is we're going to be more prone to irritability, um, insomnia, um, you know, heart, heart issues, cardiovascular problems. Um, uh, migraines, headaches, uh, Parkinson's, um, you know, all these are increasing susceptibility to having higher dopamine. You're like, whoa, Parkinson's, why? Because high dopamine levels, uh, if they stay high and you can't eliminate them, it turns into what's called a dopamine quinone and it's very toxic. And so if you look at the research on the part of the causation of Parkinson's, dopamine quinone is a big one. And um, so I started looking and, and talking with uh, folks who have Parkinson's and it's interesting to see a, a number of them do uh, have a slower COMT. So, but the research isn't really picking up on it yet. One thing though that I want to point out that's you mentioned, but just like emphasis a little bit is, is this a, a stress aversion? So I have a uh, double recessive COMT. So I think it's important to acknowledge that we may perceive an, an event, just like you said, as stressful, more stressful than somebody else. Yeah. And, and the way I experienced that personally is, you know, I'll, I'll see something in front of me as stressful and I'll usually go do it anyways, but it takes me so much longer to recover from that stressful event. Mm -hmm. and I'll just stay elevated. And, you know, something I learned early in my bodybuilding career was if I trained with classical music, it kept me level. Whereas if I trained right. with like heavy metal music, I couldn't stay focused and I would like almost get anxious. Yes. So, you know, it's like anxiety is that thing that kind of follows that stress. And so therefore your brain starts to create an association around, oh, I do this stressful thing. I get anxious. I don't want to do that. So, you know, maybe people who have more of a predisposition to anxiety, there's obviously many causes of anxiety, but maybe there's there's some correlation that I've personally drawn there that makes me then, it's almost like a, a harder fight to do the things you're afraid of because you're, you know at the other end of it, you're not going to feel awesome for a few minutes. And until you learn these kind of coping strategies, which, you know, is a big thing that I'm sure you talk about, but learning to bring yourself back down is, is a necessity for people with this type of expression, I think. It's extremely important. And this gene is, is very, very prevalent in the population. And it's yeah. very, very influencing, uh, influential on your behaviors and your actions uh, and your lack of actions as you, as you were sharing. And it's beautiful how you, how you noticed that you're in the weight room listening to hard rock or, or you know, heavy metal. And, and like a lot of people need to, to increase their dopamine so they can lift and, and they're taking their pre-workout and they're dumping their caffeine and, you know, they're, you know, and they're, they're trying to get all jacked up. And if you dumped all that caffeine and listened to hard rock, right? I'd have a heart attack. Exactly. You start getting anxious. Yeah. So these people who are consuming pre-workout and, and need that caffeine, you know, those are the, the faster CMT types. And they love working out. So, and for you, switching to classical, you know, the, the guys are in the gym are like, oh, what a wuss, you know, what a wuss. But they look at your, you know, your physique and they're like, oh, he's not really a wuss. He can handle it. And it's what interesting. And, and if you start saying, look, I've, I've tuned in. I know I'm more anxious and I, I'm, I, 
you know, it's just doesn't, that's how I, I'm wired. And it, if you understand your genes and you understand that you are slower CMT like you are, you can make those little shifts. And those little shifts are major because you could have associated working out as stressful, but it was the environment in which you were working out, which was stressful. And you switched your environment, which is again, an eco allele. Yeah, and for anyone out there who, who seems to experience that, one of the greatest things I've done is, is meditation and, and learning to bring your, your default kind of resting mindset just down into a slightly more parasympathetic place. Because if you're starting at this kind of kind of sympathetic place, it's very easy for you to kind of teeter over the edge and start getting hyper arousal and, and anxiety. So for me, it, it's like I'm the most calm guy, like you seem to be. I'm the most calm guy in the world until I'm not, right? It's this yeah. idea of Hulk smash, <laughs> like, you know, Hulk no smash, Hulk no smash, and all of a sudden it's like, oh shit. And I've learned to, thank goodness, uh, have some intervention strategies, but that was the reality of my childhood is like, I didn't understand it. And if someone had explained this to me, it would have been such an uh, amazing, empowering concept to go, hey, I mean, just stay a little calmer or maybe take these supplements or maybe be aware of your environment because it's something super arousing. Like even being in a, in a public place where there's lots of people, for me, I'm like, I want to be at home by myself in, in a room, reading a book. And, and if I'm in the car, the music's off, like that kind of stuff. I want low level stimulus. Yes. Uh, yes. Because, yeah. Because my brain just gets really hyper aroused really fast. And then I like I get focused really, really well, but my, my brain gets this hyper aroused and then it starts getting you know, almost anxious. Yeah. And just the other night, you know, and, and my wife is a faster CMT. Her head hits a pillow and I, bam, she's uh -huh. gone. And, um, you know, she tends towards depression uh, as well. Um, and anxiety, you can have, you can have anxiety having low dopamines also and, and, and for other things. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so we're watching a show and oh my God, I, I can't, I can't watch it. it. It's, it's too intense. It's this show on Netflix called Outlanders and it's, it's insane. And, but she's sitting there watching. And I was like, how can you watch this? And I, and she's like, well, don't get mad. I was like, I'm not mad. I just don't understand. Well, we're having this discussion. She, her dopamine levels are getting to a point where she's happy. Right. And, and Tasman, my oldest son, he watches horror movies. I can't watch those. <laughs> Same as me. I stopped when I was a kid, man. I, it's like, it's just the metaphor that I give myself is like, just pushes you over the edge. Like yeah. you can get close to the edge and you can live there, but you know, you get something that's super stressful in any way and it's throwing you over the edge. And I think we need to, you know, it would be awesome, not as a discrimination tool, but as a, as an optimal performance tool to do genetic testing and evaluation to see what type of student you're going to be, what type of, uh, you know, focus and, and such you'll have. So you can go into a, you know, an occupation where you will survive and thrive. If I was a neurosurgeon or a surgeon or an EMT or an ER doc, uh, you know, or, or an oncologist, I'd fail. I'd fail fast. Or and I would kill people, right? You know, and um, you know, if I was a cop, I'd probably beat the crap out of people. Sure, yeah. You know, I think so, it's important to acknowledge, like through my career, I think I I, I towed the line and I lived the edge for so long. Like now, I, I think I'd want to be a surgeon. I think I'd want to do those things that are the slightly more high stressful jobs. But when I was a kid, like there's no way I could have done it. I didn't have the coping strategies. I didn't understand, right? I didn't know that, uh, that I thought that was just like, there's something wrong with me. Like you speak of this, this idea of like, oh no, that something's wrong. I, I always have this feeling. I can't do stressful things. I was afraid of, uh, of grownups. Like there were so many levels of stress and frustration in my life. And I think there's probably a lot of people listening who go through this. And I think that's why it's important for us to kind of dive into this at, at a deeper level. And for whatever reason, I developed resilience. And maybe it's just this fact that I've, I've intentionally curated the parasympathetic activities. So the, the things you speak about on your, on your Instagram page, it's like sunshine. It's, it's you know, it's me some meditation. It's proper vitamin, uh, lots of protein. Make sure I'm, I'm supporting my internal environment and my internal, the health of my nervous system ultimately, right? Well, nervous well system. You've, you've also listened. Yeah. You know, you, you've probably made some unconscious decisions, which then you reflected inwards and said, huh, you know, when I, when I listen to classical, I feel better. Yeah. When I listen to heavy metal, I feel anxious. So a lot of us are so focused outward that we don't take the time to reflect on how heavy metal or, or these other types of musics or, or foods or the other things are in, 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 you know, triggering our genes. And so, as I say in the book multiple times over and over and over again, you have to tune in, you have to go inward to understand what's going on with you. If I 
you know, in my kids, uh, I'll, I'll walk uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, I was walking by the donuts and in the like a regular grocery store and the, and my boys, I was like, God, those smell good, huh? And, and my kids go, God, dad, yeah, we've never had a donut. And, uh, they good. I said, yeah, they're good. And, um, and they said, well, how can you just walk by that so easily? I said, because I look at it and I go beyond the taste and the smell. I go to what it's going to do to me long term. It's going to cause me irritability. I'm going to have a crash. I'm going to get fatigue. I'm going to start screaming at you. Um, I'm going to get uh, you know gluten. And so I'm going to have gut issues. I'm going to have skin issues. And so I look at that and I think what's going to happen to me if I eat it. And it's super easy. I can just admire it, smell it, and enjoy the smell and keep going. It's a really great piece of advice, both for adults and for, for parents out there. I think just that, that concept of just starting to open the door of something that happens as a result of your actions. I think many children don't get that concept taught to them. Like, I do this and therefore I see this repercussion or this this causative action that happens afterwards. I think that's huge. So speaking of you know donuts, let's use that as an example. And you saying, hey, I know that all these negative things are going to happen to me as a result of eating this specific maybe to this this dopamine or specific to any kind of physiological response. Why does that happen? From food? Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, that's a loaded question. Uh, so food has numerous components to it. Um, and well, processed food, especially, uh, if let's focus on processed food, shall we? Yep. So processed food is caloric dense. Um, processed food is, is designed. There's, there's a, when I was studying at the university of Washington and I was going through the degrees, you know, what I was going to major in, there was a degree called food science and food science is the science of understanding how food is impacting the consumer. So look at fast food, you know, you, you're trying to cut the habit, but you can't. It's, it's caloric dense food, which goes right to your brain for dopamine hit. And there's a, there's a great uh, video called the pleasure trap mm -hmm. on, on uh, it's a Ted, it's a TEDx talk. I'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah. So watch the pleasure trap and Doug Lyle, PhD, um, he's a psychiatrist or a psychologist, one of the two. I think he's a psychologist. Um, does a brilliant job in a very simple, humorous, short, 15-minute type TEDx talk. In, in a, he walks you through how processed food spikes your dopamine. And if you spike your dopamine from processed food, let's say you eat a donut, what's going to happen when someone offers you a salad? Yeah, exactly. No, thanks. And that, this, so the level of your palate is one thing, right? Because now your palate's all distorted and like, ah, it's, I don't have the crunch. I don't have the fat. I don't have all these things exploding in my mouth. And then at the level of the brain, obviously. Yeah, it's it's both. You know, mm -hmm. food science is it's like it's filling your mouth and your your uh, sensation. You know, you're, you're getting huge amounts of, of uh, input. You know, the taste buds on your tongue are exploding with with joy and flavor. And, you know, sugar is, is more addictive than actually heroin. Uh, there's another great book. Uh, it's, it's red cover. It's, it's something to do with sugar. What the hell is that called? Oh, my gosh. Um, and he walks you through the history of, of sugar mills and how sugar was lobbied. And, and they've done tests and experiments of how addictive sugar was. And, God, I'll, I'll have to email you what it is. Yeah, I'll look um, for it. Yeah, it's, it's very good. But anyway, so kids, you know, once we give our kids Coca-Cola or sugar because we're being nice, it's very tough to transition them. It's possible. But in, 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 the, in the video, the pleasure trap walks you through on how to get out of the pleasure trap. And it's I forget the duration, but it's like, you know, 24 to, or 24 hours or 48 hours or it's actually a bit longer, maybe even five, you know, five, seven days but your taste buds renew themselves. And so if you are able to limit your input or consumption of these addictive types of foods for seven days and the fastest way you can do it, actually he does talk about this. The fastest way to, to reset your taste buds is a water fast. 
I was going to say fasting, but you can't really, I mean, fasting with kids is, I was actually going to ask you about that. It's a very subjective thing. Like, I don't really know if I want a six, eight year old, 10 year old to start, I mean, maybe a 10 fine, but like a young child, like, I'm like, eh, it's a little yeah, bit, it's, I don't know. Right. It's, there's a whole, there's a sure whole. It'll be fine. Right. I'm sure it's happened many, many times. Yeah. You know, and back in our ancestor days, it probably happened a lot often, um, you know, but um, you know, it is a, is a tough situation, but you know, nowadays we have, you know, two teenagers and, and I do uh, let them, um, I don't like using that term because um, we're all unique individuals, but anyway, you know, they, they buy their own, you know, they go out and, and experiment, you know, they go to Chick-fil-A and it just, I crush. Um, but what I, what I've done now since they're teenagers and their, their friends are eating it, they're eating it. I make sure I jump in at that moment and say, Hey, look at that acne on your face. What's going on there? I know dad. Yeah. It's, it's from, it's from the Chick-fil-A. So, Hey, where's your liver support supplement? I need that. So then they take the liver support supplement, their acne goes away. So yeah, again, I don't want to, well, we'll come back to that because that's an interesting uh, kind of discussion, but I want to, I want to wrap up this, um, this brain uh, food explosion okay. thing. Yep. Um, so one thing I think that's important since we're on this track of parenting and I speak about parenting literally every podcast, cause it's my highest value. Um, parents who give their children, um, you know, uh, call it good tasting alternatives, you know, these quote unquote healthy foods that are hyper palatable, but maybe lower calorie, or maybe they're uh, just some type of switch out for the junky versions. Any thoughts on that? Cause like clearly it's doing the same thing to the dopamine pathways from my perspective. So I, I just try to eliminate it. Right. Um, but I'd be curious to hear if you had any thoughts. Yeah, I have, I have a, t a lot of thoughts on that. It's a, it's a very good point. Um, so MDs type of medicine, medical doctors, conventional, traditional medicine and naturopathic medicine. So I'm a naturopathic doctor. You know, I, I work and focus on utilizing nature as, as to heal and support us. That's my focus. And um, so what will happen is I'm getting to your point you know, in a roundabout way here. Um, you know, I come in as a patient to a doctor and I have acid reflux. If I go to an MD, they're going to give me an antacid. Mm -hmm. If I go to an ND, they could do multiple, multiple things. We have so many vast tools. You know, a medical doctor basically just says, here's an antacid and that's it. As a naturopathic doctor, we have so much we could do. But if I go to an ND who's totally focused on just getting rid of the, the acid reflux, they could give me, you know, DGL, a licorice extract. Chew this. That's it. So it's still a pill for an ill. It is not focusing on the whole problem. So if you are removing, uh, you know, caloric dense fast food, that's great. But if you are switching it out with a healthier alternative, no food coloring, no corn syrup type of things, it's still sweet. It's still, you know, exploding their taste buds. They're still getting that dopamine hit. They're still going to be averse to the salads. They're still going to be averse to, um, you know, healthy food. And that is a problem. And it's a problem we all face as parents because the damn schools um, are, you know, the, and, and soccer coaches and football coaches are, are using <laughs> living the same life as, as, as a reward. And so as much as we fight it in our own home, and it is a fight just like Xbox and Fortnite is a fight. You know, you sign up your kid to go to gymnastics or dance or piano or, you know, or outdoor school to experience these things. And then you come back and you learn that they were exposed to massive amounts of candy and fast food in every single one of those situations. Yep. Yeah. So, so I've, I've, you know, I, my little piece of a parenting advice is uh, not to you, just to the audience, I guess, but it's, it's this um, creating an identity for them. So, it's this idea of we don't do that. Like we don't eat that. Like we, we take care of our body. And, and I just indoctrinate their unconscious mind with, you know, since they're born, it's like, Oh, we don't eat that. Like, and they'll go and say that now, like, Oh, I don't eat that stuff or we don't eat that. And it's becoming part of their identity. Cause you understand, like you, you'll always rise and fall to the level of your identity. So yeah, right. if, you, if you identify as someone who's, who's strong and lean and athletic, that's, that's two things I always say to them is uh, we, we don't eat that stuff. And you're an athlete. I say to them every day, you're an athlete. It's like, I want them to treat themselves like an athlete, right? I want, and, and we always speak about learning as well, but I want them to think like, Hey, you're an athlete. What does an athlete eat like? You know, how do you, how do you fuel your body? And I'm trying to do, to do my best not to create 
psychological issues around food. And if they want to eat something or at a party, I, I don't even say a word. But uh, typically their response is, oh, I don't eat that or I, I'm going to choose something healthy. And, you know, it's certainly uh, an uphill battle for parents who are already like that far down the line of having let their kids do it. But starting to just go to the level of the identity. So rather than punishing kids or taking and taking it away from them, you go to the level of identity and say, like, you're trying to get them to think about what type of person are you? Are you someone who loves and respects their body? Are you someone who, who fuels their body? Are you someone who just, you know, eats whatever is right in front of them? Because it's in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so much to be spoken about there, but I want to keep going because there's some interesting stuff. Actually, you, you spoke a little bit about, um, well, let's just kind of come back to circle with that acne thing. So, so your son eats um, Chick-fil-A, breaks out in acne. Now, is that happening at the level of um, the microbiome? Is that happening at the level of the liver? You mentioned liver support. So is that such a stress to his liver at, at that level that it's causing this bacterial uh, shift? I thought, I thought acne was a bacterial thing. It's, it is heavily bacterial. Um, and that's why if, you know, you can, I've, I've played with all sorts of weird things and, uh, you know, my teenage boy, one of teenage boys, I've, I have two teenagers and one 11 year old. So I have 11, uh, 14 and 17 at the moment. And, um, so the 14 year old, uh, had really bad acne and he wasn't even eating that badly. He was eating pretty well. And, um, so in that situation, you know, I was like, okay, this is, we need, this is definitely hormonal, you know, testosterone kind of peaking a little bit and hormones are shifting. Um, but you know, it, this could be microbiome too. Um, so especially with the, you know, they might be switching soaps and, and, and so on. Um, so he sprayed a probiotic on his face and, uh, it was noticeable, uh, effect within the next day. Um, wow. yeah. And, and so spraying a, a probiotics on your face can be remarkable. Um, I didn't and, know that existed. Yeah, well, you, we we do it ourselves. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, we take a uh, about three capsules of a one of our products called Provida Histaminics, and we you have to take filtered water. Um, you can't put it in chlorine. Chlorine will kill it. Right. So you take filtered water. You put it in a little three ounce spray bottle. You fill up the spray bottle, maybe an ounce or two of water. You open about you know three capsules of Provida Histaminics. You dump it in there, shake it. And then you spray it on the clean face, um, you know, in the evening or, or in the morning, whatever it suits you. And you just let it dry and uh, you know, just dust it and you keep the spray bottle in the fridge. And you do that for about three days and you dump out the stuff and you, you redo it again because the, the bacteria will die. There's no food in there. Um, so you do that and, and it's remarkable, the the change. I mean, people i have shared this on Facebook Live a few times and, and parents are just crazy about it. Um, so, but in terms of, uh, food, um, you know, food is infecting the microbiome and the microbiome that we, we think that food is only adjusting our microbiome on the inside. And I think the oils that we're secreting possibly, and this is theoretical, maybe the oils that we're secreting from this food is having an effect on the, on the bacteria that are on our skin. Um, and there's, if you look at studies of the microbiome, they have a microbiome map of our entire human body. So our gluteal folds have a different type of bacteria, um, you know, in the uh, in our armpits, different type of bacteria, our faces and necks and in our hair. Um, we have different bacteria everywhere. Um, so, you know, possibly we're changing the environment of our skin and the health of our skin through these foods um, and fairly quickly. Not only that, but we're overburdening our liver. Would that be a useful? Sorry, would that be a useful application for someone who has a body odor they're trying to get rid of, like hey, this this spray bacterial? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Hundred yeah. percent. So rather than using a typical like aluminum based deodorant, because a lot of people that's their non negotiable, right? Including my my co host on the show says, you know, her non negotiable is like I have to use deodorant because if I don't, I stink. And I was like, well, maybe it's a bacterial thing. Yes. Or maybe they make her. Maybe the deodorants make whatever. It is. Like I don't want to. I don't want to say something she hasn't, but. Um, like that's her non-negotiable. Like oh, I want, I because I always want to smell good. I want to smell like a lady. Maybe there's some benefit to doing that. Yeah. Well, well, as I say in the book, uh, clean has no smell. Yeah. You know, it, it's you know, if I do not use deodorant, I've been used deodorant for ever. I, I don't even know the last time I used deodorant. And um, there will be times where I start stinking. So actually, yesterday. Um, I was doing something and I was like, well, wow, I'm kind of smelly today. Um, that's a sign that either my diet isn't so good or I need to jump in the sauna or it's both. Mm -hmm. Um, so, 
And uh, with this whole quarantine thing, I will admit I've been sitting in front of the damn TV more than I usually do. Um, but thankfully, the sun's coming out here in Seattle and I'm being more active outside again. Um, but uh, so if you have stinky armpits, that's a microbiome thing, first and foremost. And uh, it's, you know, in your gut and in your armpits. Um, and then uh, it could also be the foods that you're eating and you're eating um, things that you're are making the bad smelly bacteria survive and thrive and you eliminate those and you'll, you'll do better, but you have to figure out what those are, but first start taking some probiotics and, and jump on a sauna or just sweat. You know, you don't, if you don't have the funds to get a sauna, wear a ton of clothes and go for a walk, mm -hmm. you know, wear a ton of clothes and lay down in the sun. It doesn't matter. You just need to sweat. And if you can't sweat, then your sympathetic nervous system is, is off and uh, you need to really focus on, you know, cleaning up your environment even more because you might be full of heavy metals or, or chemicals or what have you. And the more you clean your environment, the more you avoid chemicals, uh, the better ability you have to start sweating and be able to get those out more. You mentioned testing for the bacteria and identifying which ones that are maybe causing these things. Is that something that we can just order a test for? How does that work? Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of microbiome tests out there nowadays. Um, I forget. I think you biome got the FBI has seized and just oh, really? yeah, um, they were doing a lot of illegal billing practices, I believe. Um, you know, I believe um, I'm not certain on that. I don't read the news, um, but uh, you know, I did a you biome test and I was very, very unimpressed with the results. Um, you biome has a, a, a good promise that you could, you know, you could swab your skin or your ears, or your vagina, or your anus or your poop or, you know, your nose. Um, your mouth and you could identify different, you know, types of, of bacteria um, based upon those zones. Um, it's, it's great information, but you get the information back and it's, it's not applicable yet. It's, it doesn't help. Yeah. Um, then you have Viome. Um, you know, I love the founder of Viome. Great guy. Um, lives just down the lake from me. Uh, but um, he, he's, uh, I, I, again, I don't really find too much value in these tests yet. So, I'd like looking at the functional testing, meaning that you you take a poop, you collect a sample, you send it in the lab, and uh, they say, well, these are the bacteria that you have, these are the ones you don't have, and um, you know these are good, these are not good, these are kind of good, these are kind of bad, and um, plus they look at your fats and, and other things and your inflammatory markers, I believe, and that's doctor's data. Um, doctor's data is a, is a great stool test. Um, I also talked about GI map in the book, um, but I, I'm starting to believe that GI map may not be the best anymore, um, for various reasons. Interesting. So that, that's a great thing to have. So one thing I've noticed is, um, many naturopathic practitioners will take in these, these stool tests, look at the microbiome and often have very kind of standardized protocols anyways. Hmm. Is there any, um, is there any best practices you could recommend to the audience of like, hey, if you think you have some type of dysbiosis, if you think you have some type of bacterial overgrowth, if you happen to have, you know, stinky armpits or you know, some type of funky body odor, here's two or three products you may want to try that wouldn't have any negative back uh, effects anyways. Yeah, and I, I will always uh, recoil first and, and go to lifestyle first. You can't yeah. out supplement a crappy diet. You can't. And, and so... And when I was talking with my boys, talking about the, the liver nutrient supplement for their acne, amazing supplement for acne from Seeking Health. Great stuff. What is it? Liver nutrients. From? Seeking Health. Seeking Health. That's yeah. not your company. Seeking Health is my company. Is your company, yeah. Yeah. And then the probiotic histaminics is the probiotic for the yep. make into a spray or just take orally. Um, there's there's some crazy stuff that I do with that supplement that is, is amazing. Um, so, but... Uh, my boys started taking the liver nutrients for their acne and what did it do? What do you think they did? Do you think they went to Chick-fil-A more? Of course. <laughs> they went to Chick-fil-A more. Yeah. And I was like, damn, but I didn't say anything because I knew it would work. And so they got acne. I'm like, dad, your supplement doesn't work anymore. It's like, well, you're overwhelming it. You can't, you can't just eat Chick-fil-A every day and take a liver nutrients. Your body doesn't work that way. You're not giving your body any nutrients anymore. Right. You're giving a garbage. You can have some garbage every now and then, but not like all the time. And I remember just recently, this was just a couple of weeks ago, um, Matthew was was going to Chick-fil-A with his older brother. And actually he was going to get food. And I was like, where are you going? 
And he goes, we're, we're going to get some food. And I said, where are you heading? And he goes, Chick-fil-A. And he goes, dad, I've been going to Chipotle and Cadoba like nonstop for like a month. I'm, I'm done. And uh, I was like, okay. And he goes, yes, yeah, so I'm going to get Chick-fil-A. And he goes, I, I gave myself a rule once a month. I was like, oh, well done. So he self did that on yeah. his own. I said, good job. So. Yeah. So one thing I want to uh, kind of come back to is we were speaking of CMT, people who have this uh, recessive tend to get very stressed, maybe predisposition to anxiety or stress aversion um, interventions. So I think this leads down the path of pushing us into methylation. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to just like segment that or segue that and, and get start going into this concept because everyone throws around methylation. Yeah. Everyone says, oh, you need to support your methylation. I think it's just completely misunderstood or yes. uh, heavily. Yeah, I'd love to have you start opening it up for us. Okay, so think of methylation as one key on your keyboard, on your com on your computer. That's it. You yeah. know, it's it's not this massive, uh, all encompassing uh, thing that does everything in your body. It it it's important. You know, let's say it's letter E on your keyboard. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have the letter E on your keyboard you're going to be having a mess uh, typing. So, um, but it is not all encompassing. And methylation um, is very, very important, just as letter E on your keyboard is. But you cannot forget about all the other. Again, it's a team effort. And so there are a numerous amount of genes in the methylation uh, area. And methylation is simply a, a process in the human body, of which there are many. There's glucuronidation. There's... Uh, um, my gosh, sulfuration, um, you know, there, there's, there's all sorts of, of abilities, uh, and processes going on in your body. Um, so, and if you're looking at methylation from a detoxification perspective, uh, let me show you this thing here. Uh, where is it here? Ugh. This is the Bible of toxicology. All right. Yep. It's a fantastic book on toxicology. So, you know, obviously a, a, a beast, right? And um, I was reading the detoxification section in there and they say methylation plays a very minor role in detoxification. And I was like, you bastards, <laughs> right? And but how many people talk about methylation being associated with detoxification? It's like glutathione is, is your major antioxidant. You have to methylate in order to make your glutathione that is a misnomer. It's 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 spread throughout the internet like wildfire. It is so full of misinformation. MTFR is associated with glutathione. No, it's not. No, it's not. So what is methylation? Methylation is anything that ends with ation is an action, right? So, you know, inflammation is the act of being inflamed. Mm -hmm. You know, so inform information is the act of informing. Methylation, it's the act of donating a compound to another compound. That's it. So, you know, you go to church, you put money in the plate, you're donating. At methylation, you're taking a compound in your human body called a methyl group, methylation, the act of giving a methyl group, and you're giving it to something else. So if you methylate dopamine, you give a methyl group to dopamine, you turn it into norepinephrine. If you donate a methyl group to histamine, you make it methyl histamine. If you put a methyl group onto homocysteine, it becomes methyl homocysteine, which none of us have heard about because somehow scientists decided to call methyl homocysteine methionine. Okay, so homocysteine gets methylated, becomes methionine. So, um, and, and if you methylate, if you put a methyl group on uracil, which is an RNA base, which we don't want in our DNA because that can cause all sorts of problems and cancer. You methylate your uracil and you turn it into thymine. You turn your uracil, your DNA base into a DNA, RNA base into a DNA base. And so, you know, there's all sorts of, of things that, that are really, really important. Carnitine, which a lot of uh, sports folks take for endurance or, or health or fat burning. Um, carnitine is is a, is a result of methylation. You you take lysine, a common amino acid, and you methylate it three times. Now you have carnitine. So it's uh, it's a very important component in our human body, but it is not all encompassing. And a, a really simple way to check your methylation status is to check your homocysteine level. If your homocysteine level 
uh, from your doctor. It's cheap. It's readily available. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a great start, especially given the, the, the massive unhealth of our global population, which is also why I think the coronavirus is hurting so many people. Um, you know, it's not the virus that's so bad. It's the, it's the lack of health in our population that's so bad. Um, so, but if you check your homocysteine and it's higher than, you know, eight and then an adult, you know, not great, but it's okay. Um, if your homocysteine is greater than 10, it's a problem, but the labs are saying that if your homocysteine is greater than 15, only then it's a problem. 15 is like bad. It's really bad. You don't want that. You know, you want six, seven. There's so if someone were to be 15, that would be a suggestion to, methyl to supplement with methylation? Yes, it would be a, a definite recommendation to support with methylation, things with like we called methyl cobalamin, vitamin B12, methyl folate, you know, trimethyl glycine. Do you hear these terms methyl? That's right. what you're doing. So you mentioned, I believe you said there was eight um, specific dirty genes that you were mentioning in the book. Uh, if you just want to run through those so listeners can start to have some level of awareness around which ones they should be, attention, be paying attention to and yeah. obviously to to kind of uh, inform them as to what they're going to get when they pick up your book. Yeah, well, let's, since we're talking about methylation, let's hit uh, the big one out of the park that's uh, talked about heavily, and that's the gene MTHFR. And mm -hmm. genes have abbreviations because it's the scientific mumbo jumbo in there is, is massive, yeah. and it tells – you know, the, the names are long because it tells the geneticists and the biochemists what the job of that gene does. So if I if I look at MTFR as an individual, that's really all you need to know. As a scientist, I want to know what that is. And it's, it, you know, it, it has its job. So I, I look at the whole name. But MTGFR is a major uh, regulator of methylation. If your MTGFR gene is dirty, your methylation gene, your methylation process is dirty. 100%. So, and then, and then methylation is impacting over 200 other genes plus, and more than that, 200 genes that use methyl donors, but all your genes uh, will receive methyl, methyl groups uh, to turn them on or off. So most of your genes in your body are actually off and they're turned off from a methyl group being stuck on it. So, you know, we have, uh, skin cells and cells everywhere on us. And inside these cells, uh, there's a nucleus. And inside that nucleus is our DNA. And most of that DNA is all packed up in a tiny little wad of ball, and it's turned off from methylation. So if it's, and if you're lacking methylation, you can become, uh, you know, full of cancer. And MTHFR is associated with cancer. Um, so MTHFR is discussed heavily in the book. It's what I call the, the master methylator. Um, or the methylation master, rather. And uh, so you consume folate and vitamin B2 to, to, to support that particular gene and you avoid folic acid. Sorry, we've got some construction downstairs. Okay. Hopefully he's done here soon. Um, and then the next gene is COMT. We talked about that heavily. We talked about how tyrosine is really important for COMT, but that's not only it. And um, so... You know, CMT's job is to get rid of dopamine, norepinephrine, um, epinephrine, and also um, a component of estrogen. So, but that gene in order to function needs vitamin, uh, needs magnesium. In order to function, it needs magnesium. 50% of the population or, or thereabouts is deficient in magnesium. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, and this is something that we did not talk about, Ben, but, you know, let's say that you look at your genetic report and you don't have that slow COMT, but you're fully anxious all the time. You swore you had a slow COMT. You take the quiz in the book, it shows it, I'm a slow COMT. You look at genetic report, I'm actually a fast COMT. How's that possible? Your gene became dirty. Your fast COMT gene that you're born with became a slow COMT gene because you're deficient in magnesium or other things, or you're taking an excess of tyrosine. And I walk you through that in the book. Um, uh, MAO, serotonin, melatonin, yep. and also histamine um, is, is in there as well. Um, it really, really important associated with headaches, migraines, uh, irritability, uh, focus, carb cravings, um, insomnia. It's, it's, a, it's a big one. Um, and um, 
you know, MHFR, I should have talked about conditions too. You know, you got infertility, preeclampsia, any uh, obstetric issue, uh, a lot of cancers, cardiovascular issues, pulmonary issues, you, you name it, MHFR is probably behind it. Uh, it's because methylation is that important. It's a really important process, just like the letter E in your keyboard. Um, Mao A uses riboflavin, uh, really key. It also produces a huge amount of uh, hydrogen peroxide. Um, when it's working. So hydrogen peroxide your body actually naturally makes and you need glutathione to get rid of that. Well, what's glutathione? Glutathione is your master anti antioxidant. What genes work with that? Talk about it in the book. Glutathione reductase and glutathione peroxidase, GST and GPX. Dedicated chapter in the book on glutathione. And if your glutathione levels are lower, you're in trouble. I'm going to slow you on that one because that one hits home for me. So give you a little bit of a 10 second story. When I was competing as a bodybuilder, Every time I would get closer and closer to the show, within three to four weeks, I would always start to smell like hydrogen peroxide. And I was like, what the hell is going on? I did find out I have a riboflavin deficiency or had a riboflavin deficiency genetically. So I'm seeing I'm seeing a correlation there, right? So my body was obviously producing a lot of hydrogen peroxide started coming out of my out of my pores. So as soon as I started supplementing with riboflavin, it seemed to go away. What what am I what what's the system there? Any idea? Well, riboflavin is key and it's commonly deficient. I don't know, uh, you know, I haven't really looked as to why, um, but you know, you're competing and, and you are a COMT slower, right? Mm -hmm. so, and um, when you are slower COMT, um, you're, you might be putting more burden on your mono, mono amino oxidase genes, your MAO genes mm -hmm. um, to help with that. Um, and uh you know, you're pumping up more hydrogen peroxide as a result. Um, stress will, will increase hydrogen peroxide uh, levels. Uh, infections, killing things. Um, you know, your immune system produces hydrogen peroxide in order to kill pathogens. So coronavirus, they're actually talking about using, um, I think it's a hydrogen peroxide, uh, you know, nebulized hydrogen peroxide to kill uh, the virus in the lungs. Um, so, you know, but I... Riboflavin deficiency uh, works uh, across numerous genes. Uh, one is the monoamine, so you're, you're actually getting rid of the serotonin, melatonin, and some histamines, but you're also producing hydrogen peroxide. But at that same moment, that same riboflavin that you're taking is supporting other genes, one of which is glutathione reductase, which then takes your damaged glutathione and is, re is recycling it. So as you're training and lifting weights and bodybuilding or over, you know, exercising or running or, or doing any type of exercise, doesn't matter. Um, you know, you're using your body. You are creating a stressor, and that stressor is is stimulating your mitochondria to, you know, repair. And that stimulation of repair is coming from the hydrogen peroxide. But if you you create too much hydrogen peroxide, then you become your post workout soreness increases. Your your recovery time goes uh, it lengthens. Uh, he's like, God, I'm so sore today. I can't walk. Well, you're overdoing it. Your glutathione systems are, are, are inundated. Your hydrogen peroxide levels are skyrocketing. Riboflavin will help as will electrolytes and glutathione, um, possibly even PQQ or SOD supplementation. Great. I did do, take some SOD during my competitive days for that exact reason, but I, for whatever reason, it, it's a glute, it's a gluten based or a gluten derivative. Is it not? It can be. Um, ours is not. So okay. we have an SOD at Seeking Health that is not gluten derived. I would not bring in a supplement derived from gluten. Yeah, um, I, was, I was getting it from Life Extension back then, and I was like, I'm not taking this shit. It's, it's basically gluten. Yeah, it's gluten. SOD is weird. Um, you know, I my wife will take SOD. Um, she does not do well from SOD. She takes PQQ, phenomenal for her. Glutathione, not do well meaning what? Hit or miss, but PQQ is great. What does that mean? Not doing well? She just doesn't feel right. Um, she feels from SOD, she gets stomach issues from it. Um, and, uh, it's not derived from gluten for ours. I, so I don't know what the issue is from glutathione. Um, again, she gets stomach issues from, from that. Um, but it, we, we use a liposomal glutathione. Um, but she, she does well with our, uh, liposomal glutathione plus, um, if she just takes regular glutathione, she doesn't, but liposomal glutathione plus she does okay. And the reason being, um, is it's complicated, but there's riboflavin, there's molybdenum, there's selenium, and there's PQQ in that glutathione. And so she has a, a higher need based upon her genetics that she needs that additional molybdenum, riboflavin, selenium, and PQQ when she is taking the glutathione. And when she does that, she does better. And so that's why I made the glutathione plus is because a lot of people, not a lot of people, but 
a number of people who do not do well from taking just regular glutathione, they, they feel poorly from it. Uh, I learned that if I gave them that these set of nutrients in addition, especially in addition to electrolytes, that you have to be hydrated. Um, so they, they did that. They, they tolerated glutathione way, way, way better. And so then I turned it into a supplement after I tested it enough. So we've got MTHFR, CMT, uh, MAO, and... Um, DAO, diamine oxidase, uh, very, very important for histamine. So if, you're, if you drink red wine or, or wine or, or champagne and you can't handle that at all, you get headaches, nosebleeds, irritable, insomnia, red flush face. Um, you know, if, if you can't read in cars, if you get seasick easily, um, you have... Uh, headaches, you have horrible seasonal allergies, uh, eczema, uh, psoriasis, um, you can't eat strawberries or citrus, um, and you eat fish or leftover foods, um, you know, you, you're like, God, you just hit every single nail on my head. <laughs> so many people are probably listening, you're like, oh my God, I, I was tuning out there for the past 40 minutes, but now I'm all focused. Yeah, uh, this DAO gene is very, very commonly dirty. Um, its job is to eliminate histamine from the microbiome because bacteria make um, histamine, mm -hmm. especially bad ones. Um, um, blastocystis hominis. So if you order the, the, the stool test from doctor's data and you find that there's blastocystis hominis in there, I talked with Dr. David Quigg of, of, of doctor's data and I had blastocystis hominis and I had horrible his, uh, histamine issues. Um, I would touch a, a dust bunny under a couch and I'd basically have to take a full shower. I get red dots and it would just spread. Um, it was awful. And and one day I was, uh, after I, I dealt with the blastocystis hominis and I supported my microbiome, I started taking the probiotic histaminics, probiotic and vitamin C and, and all that. And um, one day I was working on a, uh, but the, the main difference was the probiotic histaminics. Um, and uh, I was in a rental because we were remodeling our home. I pulled out the washer and dryer and I was thinking, because uh, it wasn't working, it wasn't drying the clothes, I pulled it out and it was just full of dirt and grime and dust and the pipe was full of, you know, prior tenants, garbage, and, and it wasn't evacuating the, the humid air to the outside. So I was like, oh God, I'm, I'm going to have to bathe after this. And um, so I started touching all the dust bunnies and cleaning it all up. And, you know, I was expecting my nose to start running as it usually does and my hands to get all red bumped everywhere. And But I was just going to deal with it. It never happened. I was wow. like, what the hell? What the hell? And uh, I just kept cleaning and it still didn't happen. I was like, no way. And it was a probiotic. That was that was the main change. And um, I, I could not believe my 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 respect for 10 billion bacteria just went from like, oh yeah, we need probiotics to fully understanding. Right. What happens when you have the right ones? I mean, mass, mass difference. All right. I know you're, uh, we've been taking a lot of your time, so we'll wrap up. We got still four to cover, but if you just want to mention them quickly and we'll send people to your book. Yeah. So um, PEMT, phosphatidylcholine, uh, necessary for uh, all, every single one of your cell membranes in your human body, every mm -hmm. single one. So if your PEMT gene is dirty, uh, you're, you're not functioning. Um, pregnancy, it's really, really important during pregnancy. Uh, you can, uh, lose your baby. So, and you can also have gallbladder issues. If you've got gallbladder issues, this gene is a problem. Um, and, uh, NOS three cold hands and feet. If you've got cold hands and feet or your mouth breather, you're breathing through your mouth, not your nose, um, all the time. Um, or you have cardiovascular disease in your family. You've got a dirty NOS three. You got to clean that up. Uh, and it, that gene, as I talked about in the beginning of this interview, where, you know, if you have this gene dirty, this gene dirty, and this gene dirty, mm -hmm. and, and any of those will dirty a NOS3. So any genes and dirty genes, book, yeah. that discussed, if any of those are dirty, your NOS3 is dirty. So you cannot clean your NOS3 without cleaning all the other six or seven of them. So again, it's a team. Mm -hmm. And NOS3 kills people, literally. And um, if you've been struggling with miscarriages over and over again, um, you know, it's, it's could be killing your baby too. So, uh, when women and, and, uh, start supporting their empty Jafar, NOS3, PEMT and, and COMT and DAO, they have babies. Wow. And is that, is that the extent of them? Uh, PMT, DAO, MAO, COMT, MTHFR. 
And we talked about GST, GPX. So there should be seven. GST, GPX, no, we didn't. Yeah, so that's the glutathione genes. Oh, got it. Amazing. That was a incredible masterclass on DNA, on epigenetics. And I think there's certainly three, four, five, ten more layers. We could have gone deep oh, there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hopefully we'll, have, we'll be able to have you back because I would actually really love to dive into understanding methylation of the gene and all of these other uh, expressions that happen at the gene level that really uh, is indicative of uh, methylation status of a cell. If we didn't get into that at all, that would be super interesting to have you explain sometime when we can have you back on. Yeah, and, and for the methylation status of the cell, uh, I'll just quickly state that there's a lot of things that are at play with that. And the book Dirty Genes resolves a lot of those issues. I was actually looking at creating a genetic test that looks at the methylation of genes because a genetic test is looking at just at the static gene itself. It's looking at, you know, maybe the car out front mm -hmm. or the laptop on your desk, but you have no idea what's on the inside. You don't know how it's functioning. But if you look at people's, if you order a, what's called a CPG uh, test, the methylation uh, sites, um, you could actually tell if the gene is on or off. Oh, wow. Is what do you do with that information? Right. The problem is, it just still doesn't matter if you do the a genetic test and you and you you're looking at to see if the gene is on or off because you're still going to do the same stuff that you're doing in your dirty genes book. It doesn't matter. So I, I thought I was getting ahead of myself. Well, I'm sure at some point we'll have enough information to be able to take action on on that information. We're just maybe not at that point yet for testing. Possibly, possibly, but the fundamentals are king. Dr. Ben Lynch. So grateful to have you here. And if you want to tell people where they can find you directly. Uh, yeah. So any of the supplements we talked about uh, is available at seekinghealth.com. Uh, Dirty Genes is found everywhere, which is awesome. Uh, your bookstore, once they open up again, um, mm -hmm. you get them online, Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Um, I do recommend the audio book as well. Um, uh, the audio is fantastic. But if you get the audio book, I do recommend you get it, the paperback or hardcover in addition to uh, but the audio is, is great because you you hear things that you're you're going to be missing if you read it. Do you read it yourself? Uh, oh, I've read that book uh, so many times I can't read it again. Uh, no, no, I'm saying did you read the audio? Is that you reading it? Oh, no, no, no. Um, I hired a, a, a professional. Um, so my publisher reached out to me and, and they gave me like six narrators to choose from. And uh, I picked the put – I could pick the – you know, my favorite three, I put his name three times. <laughs> and uh, so I said, there's no choice here. You're using him. I, I'm not picking anyone else. And, uh, he's beautiful. He did a beautiful job. Um, and you can find me on Instagram and Facebook uh, at, DR, at DR Ben Lynch on Instagram and, and Dr. Benjamin Lynch on Facebook. And I highly suggest people go over and follow you because you do an amazing job with all of your data reviews and you've had uh, amazing commentary around coronavirus and some other um, maybe human issues that we're experiencing now during Corona. And if people want to go check those out, I highly suggest it. Uh, Dr. Ben Lynch, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ben. And that's a wrap, ladies and gents. Hope you loved my conversation with Dr. Ben Lynch. Definitely a very, very bright man. If you don't already know, we're also offering these podcasts now on YouTube. So if you're someone who likes to watch videos on YouTube in the morning and actually see my funny facial expressions as I converse with these amazing, brilliant professionals, you can head over there and make fun of my expressions and my amazing haircut. Or just continue listening on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you do love the podcast, we would love a review because that's what drives this podcast. Subscribe, review, send it to at least one person you know and love. So this is one of those conversations where I think everyone needs to hear this stuff. Everyone needs to have at least this little bit of information as far as understanding that, hey, you can change your genetics. Hey, you can change the expression of these things. And if you do so, guess what? You can really make a difference on your life. You can really shift things, even though maybe you felt like your health wasn't going well, or maybe you were stressed, or maybe you were anxious and didn't know some of these things. Well, guess what? We're empowering you now with the knowledge and ultimately the skill set to take action. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, head over and follow Dr. Ben Lynch as well, because I know you would love it. Have a great day, guys. Live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love.
Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.